Welcome to Boomi EDI Fundamentals Training. This class is for a person who is brand new to EDI. If you're already an experienced EDI developer and are looking to learn about how EDI works with Boomi, please answer the test out questions to begin your training with our Boomi EDI Basic Training class. We begin this class with an introduction to EDI. Our discussion focuses on what EDI is, why it is used, and its benefits. We move on to discuss some of the hurdles of EDI adoption as well as its value proposition. We wrap up this section discussing the EDI business processes and learning EDI terminology. Our next section, Getting Started EDI Basics, defines Boomi's definition of EDI and defines the EDI standards and training partners. Next, we move into a detailed conversation on vans, including the definition of a van, learning about their services, and why we use them, and if Boomi is a van. Our final section addresses what you need to have before you create an EDI process in Boomi. We'll take a quick look at specs and sample data. Let's begin by defining EDI. As defined, by EDIBasics.com, EDI is a computer-to-computer -computer exchange of business documents in a standard electronic format, such as X12 or Edifact, between business partners, which commonly are referred to as trading partners. Let's break down each phrase of the definition. EDI replaces snail mail, fax, and email. While EDI is electronic, the exchange documents are handled by people, which slows the document processing and introduces errors. EDI documents flow straight through to the receiver's computer and begin processing immediately. EDI documents are exchanged between businesses. The most common are purchase orders, invoices, and shipment notices. Because EDI documents are processed by computers, you must use a standard format to describe each piece of information so the computer can read the documents. Today, there are many EDI standards, X12, Edifax, and Tradecoms, and versions such as X12 850 or Edifax version D12 release A. When businesses exchange, EDI documents, they must agree on the specific standard and version. The exchange of EDI documents between two different companies is referred to as trading partners. For example, Company A may buy goods from Company B. Company A sends orders to Company B. Company A and Company B are trading partners. Let's take a look at the business types EDI supports. In government, EDI exists in federal procurement. Transportation uses EDI to track motor carrier load tenders and request shipments. In healthcare, EDI is used to file medical claims for insurance companies and to adhere to HIPAA standards. It exists in banking for accepting payment information. Finally, EDI is heavily used in manufacturing and retail for handling invoices, purchase orders, and shipment notices. How does EDI deliver value to its customers? It improves supply chain and operational efficiency by focusing on logistic programs and eliminates duplicate steps in the supply chain. It decreases inventory costs by reducing paperwork and errors in rekeying of documents. Document processing speed and accuracy improve due to electronic processing. It greatly reduces, if not eliminates, time delays connected with manual processing, which requires a person to enter, file, and compare data. It allows you to keep full visibility of your data. All of this provides you with a comprehensive advantage and allows you to make better decisions and increase customer satisfaction.
The two most important benefits for a business to implement EDI are speed or time. EDI decreases the time it takes for an employee to create invoices and manually handle purchase orders. Timing is important when it comes to the processing of an order. With EDI, businesses can speed up their cycles by 61%, creating an allowance for a more automated process, which reduces, if not eliminates, time delays related to manual processes for you to compare, enter, and file data. Prior to EDI, transactions took up to five days by paper, can now be completed under an hour. An example of this is an American Automotive Corporation, which reduced a key cycle time by 97%. This resulted in a 30-day process reduced to 24 hours. Accuracy. Using a manual approach, you are likely to get errors, usually from entry or re-entry of errors impossible to understand handwriting, and improper documentation. EDI improves your business data quality and removes the problem of reworking orders by at least 30 to 40 percent drop in transaction errors. Both of these result in lower costs and improved efficiency of your business processes. An added bonus is that you become a preferred partner, which could lead to additional business. There are three hurdles new companies must overcome to EDI adoption. They are perception, scope, and cost. With perception, often EDI is viewed as a file format, when in fact it is much more. In addition to being a technology, it is also a business enabler. Many companies do not recognize the need or support the change of manual business processes. The scope of the process change is needed for EDI. Going from a manual to an automated process is a large scope project with effort involved in legacy process reengineering. This impacts both skill sets and bandwidth. Finally, time, money, and resources. There are demands, but the payoff at the end can be big. This concludes our introduction. Let's move on to our next section, Getting started with EDI basics. Let's get started by looking at some basic EDI concepts. In this section, we learn Boomi's definition of EDI. Next, we discuss the various EDI standards, such as X12 and Edifact. We will then focus on trading partners who play an important role in EDI. Our final topic is VANS, a value-added network. Let's begin by discussing Boomi's definition of EDI. Dell Boomi's definition of EDI is as follows. Electronic data interchange is the electronic exchange of business documents in a mutually agreed upon format between business partners. EDI replaces the traditional process of preparing data in paper form and sending it by email, snail mail, or fax. EDI business communications is not restricted by software, equipment, or computer. The EDI profiles represent the structure of the different EDI documents that are sent through processes, including all the segments and data elements. Similar to the X12 profile, the EDI profile allows you to configure repeating data sets or loops. You can also organize segments in header, detail, and summary loops. Let's look at EDI standards. EDI standards describe the strict format of electronic documents these include the formats, character sets, and data elements that are used in exchange of business documents and forms. Both required and optional information for a particular document are defined, and the rules provide the structure of the document. Think of standards as similar to building codes. You can have two kitchens built to code, but look completely different. Two EDI documents can follow the same standard but contain different sets of information. 
At the time of this recording, Dell Boomi supports the following EDI standards. X12, which is one of the most popular and is verified by the ANSI ASC, which is the Accredited Standards Committee. Edifact is used primarily in European countries. Tradecoms is a precursor to Edifact. RosettaNet is XML based. HL7 is used in healthcare by doctor's offices and hospitals, and custom is what you define. Some additional EDI standards include industry-specific standards, such as health insurance, we have HIPAA. For European telecommunications, ODAT is being used, and in the German automotive industry, VIDA is being used. Our final section deals with trading partners. Trading partners are any organizations exchanging EDI documents or data. Looking at this diagram, we are trading between multiple trading partners. For example, I am in orange and I am trading with my trading partner who is in black. Now that we understand the standards, let's discuss what is a trading partner. It may refer to a company the client is trading with, the legal entity, or it may refer to a trading partner. They are different entities. So why is it important to understand the difference? Because licenses in EDI are calculated differently than non-EDI customers. In EDI, Boomi does not charge you for connections used inside of your trading partners. So if you use an FTP connector inside of a trading partner, the license connection doesn't count. However, we do count the trading partner. If you use an FTP connector outside of a trading partner, you still need to pay for the connector. As mentioned, in EDI, Boomi does not charge for each connection used inside of the trading partner. So if you use an FTP connector in a trading partner, the license connection does not count. We only count the trading partner. If you use the FTP connector outside of the trading partner, you still need to pay for the connector. Our final topic in this section is VANs, Value Added Network. Think of a van as being an electronic post office. Similar to when you drop a letter in the outbound mail slot at your local post office and the postal service decides where the letter should go and tracks its delivery, a van performs a similar function with electronic data. A company deposits the outgoing documents into their outbound mailbox. The van examines the sender and the receiver in the data that you deposit. The van then decides the routing based upon the trading partner relationship. This would be your sender and receiver IDs, and it routes the results to either the receiver's mailbox, if it's on the van, or through a third-party interconnect to the receiver's van. A value-added network, or a van, is a hosted service which acts as an intermediary between trading partners, sharing data via the business processes. Value-added networks are used by large companies. Vans usually work in a mailbox setting, during which a company sends a transaction to a van and the van places it in the receiver's mailbox. The receiver contacts the van and picks up the transaction and sends it to its own transaction. The system is similar to email, except it is used for standardized structured data and not unstructured text. So what does a van provide? Well, they provide managed services, data translation, editing, format conversion, syntax verification, and alerting. Some also provide application layering offerings, configuring price quotes, order management, data synchronization, or e-catalog. Think about a van as providing a neutral, third-party confirmation that their transaction was received. So, 
Why is most EDI traffic still exchanged through a van? Well, vans offer a simple cost-effect solution to connect with the trading partners who support multiple connectivity protocols. It's easy to exchange data with a van because the van makes the unique connection requirements to your trading partner invisible to you. Vans use volume-based processing charging on the volume of data going through. Most vans support a tiered pricing model. As you hit a certain tier, the charge for the incremental volume or incremental documents drop. So the van usage gets cheaper the more volume you have. So, is Boomi a van? It is important for you to understand that Boomi is not a van and Boomi does not offer the services connected with a van. We cannot replace a van. To Boomi, a van is simply a connection pathway that Boomi connects to. Boomi can connect to and work with almost any van. Boomi also manages its operation based upon entering the trading partner, not the path to the trading partner. So vans are very close to being invisible to Boomi from an operational standpoint. EDI does not have to be sent via van. It can be sent using Boomi's native connectors such as AS2, FTP, and SFTP. EDI can also be used with other features of Dell Boomi such as APIs and mailboxes. This concludes this section of the class. Please continue to the next section of the Boomi Fundamentals class before you begin. We're now going to take a look at the things you will need to have before you begin a Boomi EDI process. You need to know the following before you get started. What standard you are using, such as X12, Edifact, RosettaNet, the version being used, such as 4010, 5010. You need to have some sample data so you understand what you're loading into your system. From the sample data, you can determine the transaction type you have so you can get the spec. If the spec is unavailable, such as you're using a custom standard, you need to have a file definition. And finally, you need to understand the communication type. What are you sending to, receiving from? Are you using a van? How do I connect to these? One of the items you need is a sample data file. This is a scaled down version of an EDI X12850 data file. By examining this code in detail, you can discover much information. The EDI format consists of the connected document components. Let's take a look at the file. First, the delimiter. This is a unique character which separates each data element. In EDI, the delimiter is usually a star. The segment terminator is a unique character that identifies the end of the segment. In our case, it's a tilde. An EDI segment is a group of related data elements. A segment begins with a data identifier and ends with a segment terminator. The data element or field is the basic unit of information. This represents a single fact. The qualifier is a detailed data element predefined by EDI standards to classify key data. In our example, IAA is a valid qualifier for the REF segment. A loop is a collection of potentially repeating information. Finally, the identifier instance is a flag in the EDI structure used to describe the detailed data set based on a numeric occurrence qualifier. This is a shortened version of an X12850 spec, which displays a sample segment so it will fit on one slide. It contains each of our three areas, heading, detail, and summary. Reading the spec from left to right, it displays an M if the segment is mandatory, the position number, the segment ID, the name, if it's required, it has an M in it, if it's optional, it has an O, the maximum number of times it's used, if it is a loop, 
and it repeats, the number of times it repeats, and finally some notes and comments. When you move to our EDI Basics class, you will see how to use this spec and your sample file format to create an X12850 EDI transaction. This concludes our EDI Fundamentals class. After reviewing our questions about the class, you will move on to the EDI Basics class, where you'll learn how EDI works with Boomi. Hello everyone and welcome to EDI One Training. I am excited to offer you Dell Boomi's EDI One Training Solution. Before we begin, I want to make sure you have three pieces of information available to you. One is our EDI Guide, which would be EDI underscore guides underscore version 7.0.pdf. The second is the 850 EDI for ABC.EDI, which is a sample EDI file. The final are Walgett's underscore 850 spec.pdf, which we'll be needing for our class. Atomsphere sits in the cloud and is easily reached from any internet browser using platform.boomi.com. Although any browser can be used, we have seen the least amount of issues using Mozilla Firefox and Google Chrome due to their Java handling. So if you don't have a preference, please think about using one of these browsers. Before we begin, I'd like all of us to log in. What you will do is you will log in with your email address, your password, and then you will click on log in. If you have any issues logging in, you can just click on the help, I forgot my password. I'll give you a moment now to log in. This is the same training account you've been using for all of your training. Under our process library, we have Boomi Training, we have the connectors that you're using, and then we have your Boomi Essentials class. If you have any other classes, they would also be loaded in this folder. Our EDI class will focus on three sections. The first is known as Create. Basically, this is where we will focus on an 850 or a purchase order to understand how to process the 850 in Atomsphere. We will use a message step for our input and a MySQL database as our output. The second focuses on trading partner creation, trading partner acknowledgement, and explores various methods of communications, including AS2, FTP, SFTP, and DIS. Finally, we learn to add document tracking to our purchase order, so when we deploy and run our process fields, we'll be exposed on our Manage tab. I'm now going to walk through our first exercise to verify our existing setup, which would be your Boomi Essentials setup, and to create your EDI1 folders and download your first process. This is in your book, beginning on page 4 and ending on page 7. Prior to this class, you should have attended Boomi Essentials, which means you will have at the very least in your component library a connections folder with some connections loaded already in it, and then you will have your Boomi Essentials folder, which will contain your entire account XML to CSV process. Also, you will come over to the Manage tab and go into Atom Management. In Atom Management, you have two environments. You have your production environment, which has an Atom Cloud attached to it, and then you have your test environment, which has a test Atom Cloud attached to it. All of this was done in your Boomi Essentials class. We're going to prepare for our class. So we're going to come over here, and where we have Boomi Training, we are going to click on the drop down. We're going to select New Folder, and we're going to create an EDI1 folder. So we're going to create a folder, and we're going to name it EDI1. Click on Save. And underneath our EDI1 folder, we're going to create a folder to house our first section of work. We will use the drop down next to the EDI1. We will select New Folder. And our folder is going to be called EDI Inbound Create. So we've created two folders, one for our EDI class and then one to house our first section of work. Next, we want to click on the Browse Process Library hyperlink. 
This is going to take us to the process library. If we click on process name and we scroll all the way to the bottom, because we begin with a W, you are going to find something that says Walgett's 850 Inbound Create. What we're going to do is install this process. You'll need to give it the location. It's going to need to go into your EDI1 folder and then the folder you just created called EDI Inbound Create. We'll click on Install. It was installed and now we'll click on the Close button. You'll see that your folder was now populated and we now have a process. You're going to see that we have a process that was loaded into your folder. We're going to take a look at this Walgett's 850 inbound process very shortly. It's now your turn to do exercise number one to verify the existing setup, create the EDI folders, and download the process. When we come back, we're going to take a look at section one, the create section. Looking at our create section, we will begin by discussing what we need to have available prior to the beginning of any EDI Atmosphere development. We will review the input contained in the message shape. We will review the output, which will be a MySQL database and we will focus on mapping our X12 field. Before beginning, I do want to point out that some of the information contained in here may seem light to anyone with an EDI background, but please hang in here because the class is designed to handle all levels of the EDI experience. So let's examine what you need to have available before beginning any EDI process. In Atomsphere, before creating an EDI process, you need to understand and have available the following your spec, and your sample data. You must have a good understanding of the data in your file. You need to understand and identify all the required segments and where they reside. Are they in the header, the body, or the summary? Finally, you need to understand the communication method that will be used to communicate with your customer. Where is the data coming from? Where is it going to? So let's begin with the data. For those of you who have never seen an EDI file before, you can see it has many specific sections. This is a scaled down version of the EDI data file we are going to use in class. By examining the code in detail, you will discover much of the information needed to map your 850. EDI uses a structured document format, allowing the Dell Boomi platform to build solutions using the specifications given by the company or trading partner. Usually EDI is independent of the company's internal applications. The EDI format consists of connected document components, so let's take a look at the file. First is the delimiter. This is a unique character which separates each of the data elements. In EDI, the delimiter is usually a star. Next is the segment, which is the business document, logically grouped together with one or more data elements. It's a segment terminator. This is a unique character that identifies the end of a segment. In our case, it will be a tilde. The data element is the basic unit of information. It contains a set of values representing a single fact. The qualifier is a detailed data element predefined in Atomsphere to classify key data. In our example, IA is a qualifier for the REF segment. Loops are a section or group of repeating sub-segments in one document instance. Finally, the identifier instance is a flag in the EDI structure used to describe a detailed data set based on a numeric occurrence, qualifier, or both. This is a shortened version of our spec. It displays only the segments that we are going to use in class, so it will fit on one slide. It contains three areas. The heading, the detail, and the summary. Reading this back from left to right, it displays an M in the segment if it's mandatory, the position number, segment ID, name, required if it's, if it's required, the maximum number of times used, if the loop repeats, and the number of times it repeats, and finally, some notes and comments. Now, I mapped EDI in an earlier life, and I needed to know each piece of information on my spec. 
However, in Atomsphere, there's only one thing that I need to know, and that is the segment ID, and Atomsphere will do the rest. Within the file, there are three areas or sections. They are known as the header, the body, and the summary, and each has both mandatory and optional data. For an 850, the following segments are required for the header. ST, which is the transaction set header, BEG, which is the beginning segment for the purchase order, REF, which is the reference identifier, TDD, which is the terms of sale or the, or the deferred terms of sale, DTM is the date time reference. EO1, where the baseline item detail is on the only mandatory segment in the body of an 850. The summary total has two pieces of information that are required segments, CTT, which is the transaction totals, and SE, which is the transaction set trailer. All other data passed into the file is optional. We'll begin our class with a partially built process and complete it by focusing on the EDI particular step, such as the trading partner, EDI profiles, and mapping. So let's take a few moments and understand today's EDI integration scenario. Our company, Walgets, purchases products from Boomi. Now in the past, Walgets completed purchase orders via email. Our process will set up an EDI X12850 for Walgets to systematically exchange documents with Boomi using the X12 standard. The Boomi developer will copy and paste a sample Walgets purchase order into the message step. In the real world, we would read the data in from a disk, FTP, SFTP, or use an AS2 connector, which we're going to be doing in the second part of our class. The purchase order, the 850, is then translated into a MySQL database. So we can run this process many times in our test environment. We have set up a program command containing a SQL script to clear out the 850 from the MySQL database. And as I mentioned earlier, this class works with an existing process and we are going to be adding the detailed EDI information. This is the process that we're going to be using in this class. Our 850 EDI data is contained in the message shape. It will then move down branch 1, where it will delete the existing PO data from the database. This allows only the latest data in the database. We will then load the data into a profile, map it, and write it to our database. Our process begins with the start shape, which has a no data option selected because it's not receiving data from any source. It expects an empty document, and the data is received from the message shape. All EDI data in this section is populated in the message shape. This allows us to review the data on the fly. Later in class, we will examine a different communication methods, and at that point we'll be receiving our data with a trading partner. This ends the start shape in receiving our input data. And as we've learned in our Boomi Essentials class, Atomsphere development is completed from the endpoints first, focusing on the connectors. We are writing our data to a MySQL database, so let's quickly review the core database connector options. It is the main component containing all the information needed to connect with a single database instance, and like many of our connectors, it consists of two parts. The connection, which is known as the where, this is the database type, location, and user login. The second is the operation, or the how, which houses the reader-write statement or stored procedure call and record groupings. Since this is completed, we will not review this shape any further. With our input and output shapes completed, let's examine the 850 to database map. The database profile is added to the map, but there is no 850 profile. And our next section will address the EDI profile. We're now going to examine the EDI profile. So what exactly is an EDI profile? Well, the EDI Profile Data Elements tab allows you to manually add or import segments to define the EDI document field structure. First, you will define your standard. Are you using X12, Edifact, or HL7? Within your standard, you can select your transmission. This allows you to select and import predefined segments for the selected version. 
Based on the looping section being constructed, Atomsphere will automatically add the segment or segments to the appropriate section loop. Next, you will need to define the file layout using the Options tab. And finally, if you are creating a user-defined EDI profile, you will need to manually add the child loop segments and data elements and identifier instances on the Data Elements tab. To access the Create Component drop-down window, what you will do is click on the blue drop-down arrow next to Component Explorer, where you want to create your new profile and choose New Component. Within the Create Component window, you will choose your profile. You will give your profile a name. You will make sure it's going to the correct location, and then select EDI for the profile format. Once you select EDI, you will need to select the standard that you are using. A dialog is then displayed asking if you want to import your profile. Since we know what type of profile we want to use, we're going to press Import to define our EDI profile. To select the transmission, we will use the drop-down to select 4010, and the version we can enter 850, click on the search button, and it will retrieve it for us. Once it retrieves it, we'll just highlight the transmission and click on the OK button. Now earlier, when we were discussing the spec, I said the only thing you need to know is what segments are contained in your spec. The Data Elements section, well in the Data Elements section, you just check out the segments contained in the spec and Atomsphere will do the rest. Now keep in mind, you want to check off all segments that are in your spec, whether they're mandatory or optional, so you have access to them in your profile. Once selected, Atomsphere will automatically create the profile containing all of your data elements, including all of your looping. I'm going to walk through exercise number two to configure your EDI transaction structure. This begins in your book on page 8 and it goes up to page 12. All right, we're going to begin by configuring our EDI transaction structure. We're going to go to our directory and we're going to click on the drop down and select new component. We're going to call this Walgets 850 profile. We're going to make sure it's going to our EDI inbound create directory, which it is. And the type of profile it's going to be, the profile format, is going to be EDI. Now, we need to select the standard at this point in time. We have our choices between X12, which is the default, Edifact, HL7, and User Define. We're going to select X12. We click on Create. We have a Getting Started screen. In our Getting Started screen, it's asking us if we want to import a profile or if we want to manually create the profile. You want to import the profile if it is Edifact, HL7, or X12. The only time you want to manually create a profile is if it is a custom profile. So we're going to import our profile. We choose our version. This we will have to select. It's going to be 4010. It'll list all the different document types for 4010. Now ours is 850, which is pretty far down there. So we're just going to type in 850. So I just typed in 850. It came up with 850 purchase order. I highlight it and then I click OK. At this point in time, it will bring up the segments for an 850 and all we will have to do is select them. What I've done is I have divide up my screen and on one side I have my Walgoods 850 spec. On the other side I have my platform. What we typically do is if you have more than one screen, of course you will put your spec on one screen, your platform on the other. Since I only have one screen I can project this with, I'm going to just put them, split the screen and put it all on one screen. I have to choose a segment or segments. It has my three data elements, my three areas over here, my header loop, my, de my detail loop, and my summary loop. And over here it has all the segments that would be defined in the header. It has all the segments that would be defined in the detail and all the segments that would de be defined in the summary. I take a look over here and if it's listed on this side, I just check it off. So I'll just go ST for the transaction set header. 
EEG for the beginning segment, REF. REF is the reference identifier. PER is the administrative communication contact. FOB, relate, FOB related instructions. CSH is right here. It is the sales requirements. Next what I have is I have SAC. Now when I come down here, you will see that SAC is a loop. So I need to expand this and inside of it I have two sections. I have SAC and CUR. Over here it's telling me I only need one. I only need the SAC part, portion of it. So I'm just going to click on this. The next one is ITD, so I will click on that, and then DTM. Now the next one listed here is TD5, and if I look at the position numbers, DTM is 150 for my date time reference, and for my carrier details, my TD5, that is 240. Now what that tells me is I'm going to have to scroll down quite a bit in order to find it. So it's not going to be right after it. And here it is down here. So here's my TD5 segment. The next one I'm going to go to is on 295. This is my N9 loop. So I'm going to come down a little bit, and you'll see that there's a loop for N9. When I expand it, there are three things in the N9 loop. There's N9, DTM, and message. I only need N9 and message. The next is the N1 loop, and this is a common loop. This contains all your name, address information. I only need the first four pieces of this, the N1, N2, N3, and N4, which is my name, my additional name information, address information, and geographic location. And that's all I have for my heading section. The next one I have is my detail section. The detail has one main loop and that is called PO1, but when I expand it, there are many things in PO1. So I'm going to select PO1, CPT, which is another loop inside of it. I'll go down and select another loop, which is PID, and I'll be looking for that, and then I'll select PO4. I'll come down to the SAC loop. I'll be selecting that. The SAC is the Service Promotion Alliance in Charge information, so I will be selecting SAC, and then I'll go down a little bit further, and this start, notice that this is 130, I, the next one is 470, so I will be going down quite a bit, and I'll be looking for SLN, and SLN is pretty far down there, and I'm looking for the subline detail, and then finally, I'll look at the PID within there, which is the product item description. The last thing I need is a summary. I have that down here. The two that I will be doing, I'll expand the CTT loop, and I will select CTT, which will be my transaction totals, and then SE, which is required. This is my transaction set trailer. Once I've selected everything, I will click on close. I will and click on OK. And now it'll build out my header. So what if I made a mistake? I built my header and now I said, oh my goodness, I made a mistake. Let's just, for example, this CUR, I need this. So this is gonna come after my BEG line. So what I will do is I will select it. But notice what is done is it's placed this at the bottom of my header loop. So what I will do is I will just come up here and move it up. So now I have my ST line, I have my BEG line, I have my CUR line, and I have my REF line. Well, of course, we don't need the CUR line, so maybe I added that by mistake, or maybe I've added other things by mistake. What I would do is just click on the drop-down, and I would click on Delete Segment, and it goes away. So once you are pleased with your data elements, you'll click on the Save button to save your data elements. All right, now it's your turn to complete exercise number two to configure the EDI transaction structure. This begins in your activity guide on page eight, and it goes up to page 12. When we return, we're gonna be examining the Options tab of the profile. Let's now examine the Option tab of the EDI profile. 
you can select the Options tab to define your EDI profile. In order to help us understand the Options tab, I have displayed the 850 EDI for abc.edi file in my notepad. This is located on the other side of my screen. Take a quick look at how we can figure out the information that we need to create our files. Now, what we're looking for over here is the standard. We're going to know what our standard is. It's going to be either X12, Edifact, HL7, or User Defined. For the file types, we have two types. We have data positioned and delimited. Data position means that everything from 1 to 15 is the name, 16 to 35 is the address, and so on and so forth. With delimited, it means that there is a character of some sort that's actually dividing each field, and that is what we're using is a delimiter. There's quite a number of different delimiters. All EDI X12 files use a star, but we'll go through the various delimiters when we go in and set up our options tab. The segment terminator is how we are terminating each line. We're going to be using a tilde for that. X12 uses tildes. And the last one is the composite delimiters. And this is going to vary based upon trading partners. We'll go in and discuss that more when we set up the options tab in our activity. And down here we have our version information. This is already set up for you. However, this is going to contain the version type the version itself and the transaction type. The version can be found in the GS line, which is going to be 4010. The transaction type is contained in the ST line, and here it is listed as 850. We have a number of options known as the X12 options that are below the version information. This contains the interchange control standard. We have two available to you. It can be you, which is the EDI user community of AS12, TDCC, and UCS, which is the default, or X, which is, which is the US EDI community of ASC12. We're using X, and you can find that information in your S12 envelope, uh, the next to the last field. We have a couple of others. Uh, these are checkboxes. Do you want to use the start and end? You can check this if you want to put a start or end segment on each loop. They ignore undefined segments. If you check this, the system will ignore any undefined segments before or after each loop. And then to ignore the undefined. If this is checked, the system will ignore any undefined data elements and will not generate an error. The X12 options are rarely used. They are legacy support. We had a version called version 3X. Probably someone is using it, so therefore we have uh, the X12 options defined here. So now I'm going to demonstrate exercise number three to configure the EDI profile options. And I'm going to do class activity number one, which is to import the EDI profile into the 850 EDI to database map. This begins in your book on page 13, and it will go up to page 15. I have the EDI profile on one side, and I have the file, the 850 EDI for abc.edi file on the other side. So I can take a look at the file and choose my options. As I mentioned, the standard is going to be X12, but we also could use Edifact, HL7, or User Defined. The type can be data positioned or delimited. We're going to go with delimited. Because it is a delimiter, we need to define the file delimiter. In our case, the delimiter is a star. So we'll just highlight the star, but it could be comma, tab, tick mark, bar, plus, colon, caret, ampersand, byte, or something else. The segment terminator, the default is no end character. But we actually do have a, a segment terminator. It's on the end of each segment. It is a tilde. And it's all the way over here. So we want to make sure we select it. And finally, the last one is the composite delimiter. In your book on page 13, we have an excellent description of the composite delimiter that I'd like to go over with you. It says the composite delimiter sets the delimiter between the composites within the segments. It is contained in the spec and it is not used in X12 processes. 
so therefore we tend to use the default of a colon. The composite delimiter is mostly used in edifact. So we're going to be doing X12, so therefore we're going to select the default, which is going to be a colon. Now you want to make sure the following fields are entered. We have the version, the transmission, the transaction functional ID, which is a PO, and then the version control number. If this is incorrect, you can click on the magnifying glass and then you can search and search the documents and it will be populated. So at the end of this are our X12 options. We do want to make a change to this. We want to change the interchange control standard. We're using U, which is the default. We want to make sure that this is an X. The other fields are not being used, so we will not be checking them off. This concludes exercise number three to configure the EDI profile. Now I'm going to continue with class activity number one. However, if you would like to do this on your own and then come back and see how it works, you're more than welcome to. I'm going to save and close. And we're going to go into our Walgoods 850 inbound create. And when we go into and we enter the map, what we will see is that the database has been set up for us, the database profile. But our profile, which is the EDI profile, has not been set up. So what we're going to do is select our EDI profile. It defaults this database, so we'll select EDI. And we'll path down. And here's our Walgoods 850 profile. We will select it, and we will populate it. So now we have both our source and our destination. So now we have our source and our destination. Now it's your turn to do exercise number three to configure the EDI profile options and class activity number one to import the EDI profile into the 850 EDI to database map. This begins in your book on page 13 and it ends on page 15. When we return, we will be discussing how to map in EDI. Now it's time to discuss best practices when mapping EDI. The 850 EDI profile is the source profile in your map. The next few slides will address how to map EDI field. There are two methods when mapping an EDI. The first is to use Boomi Suggest. Now Boomi Suggest works, but you need to be very, very careful when using Boomi Suggest in EDI because many names are unique and you may get too many or too few matches. The most reliable method is to manually enter the EDI values and to compare the system data against the EDI file and map appropriately. I know it's not pretty, but it works. I also want to point out that many systems um, who map EDI fields, this is the way they work. In my earlier life, before Dell Boomi, this is how we made sure that we correctly map our EDI fields. So before mapping our fields, I want to discuss the Boomi recommended mapping method for anyone who is doing EDI development. We begin with mapping our simple one-to-one -one field maps, in this case our EDI to database fields and entering in any default values. Next, we'll focus on the EDI identifier instances, which allow EDI to handle qualifiers. Finally, we will add functions, and we're going to begin with standard functions and then move into complex user-defined functions. I'm going to go through at class activity number two to map the level one source and destination fields. I'm going to go through class activity number three to set the default values. Then I'm going to do exercise number four, which is to update our SQL command, and exercise number five to test our process. This begins in your book on page 16, and it goes up to page 19. Typically, when people want to go out and map, they want to use Boomi Suggest. So if I click on Boomi Suggest, you're going to see that I have 35 high confidence level suggestions, one medium confidence level, and one low confidence level. And if you look in your book, what you will see under activity number two is that there are nine fields that we want you to map. And I can tell you that two of those fields are not listed in Boomi Suggest. 
It is quite a bit of work to go through to get seven fields. It's more efficient at this point in time if we map these fields manually. I'm going to go out and do the first one, which is BEG03, which is my customer reference. And I'm going to take BEG03, and it's also going to go to my pick ticket ID. Now, one of the things I want to point out to you is notice that this field, this BEG03 field, which is in my source, is going to two locations. It's going to customer reference and pick ticket. You can have a source field go to multiple locations, but a destination can only receive from one source. So my customer ref could not receive anything from any, from any of the other source fields. So continuing on, I have my BEG05 that's going to go to my order date. And I'm going to do one more, my PER02. PER02 is going to go to my ship to contact. So I'll come down to this field and I will ship to contact. What I'm going to do is pause so you don't have to watch me map everything. And when we return, I'll have all the fields mapped. Welcome back. I just mapped my final two fields, CTT01 and 2, to total line count and total quantity. I'm going to save. We are going to go into class activity number 3. We're going to set the default values. So we do have a few default values we're going to be setting. The first one is our company key. I'm going to click the drop down and I'll say set default value. We're going to type in a 59. Basically just identifies our class in the database. We're going to do a priority. Priority is going to be set to 1. We have a status field. Our status field is going to be set to zero. We have a warehouse key field. Now be careful, there is one that is where, warehouse ID and then there's warehouse abbreviated key and we're using warehouse abbreviated key. We're gonna set a default value there of two. Now, an important one that we're going to do is we're going to come up and set a user ID field and please place your first name. I'm going to enter the name EDI Instructor. Now, I've entered in the word EDI Instructor. What you want to do before you click on OK and you save this field is you want to highlight this field and just copy it and click OK. Now we'll click on Save and Close. OK again. The next place we're going to is the program command, which is our SQL statement. What this does is it comes through and it'll delete everything in the order header for the user ID equals the user ID that we passed in. So what you want to do is just, you want to highlight the word trainer and you want to paste whatever you typed in for the user ID. So in this case, I typed in EDI instructor. And so now I'm going to click on OK. We're going to save. Now what we want to do is exercise number five. This is in your book on page 19. We're going to test our process. So we click on the test button, the blue test button. We click the drop down, select the test atom cloud, and we click on run. All right, the process is ran. So let's take a look at the output. What's going to happen is we're going to do our no data start shape, our message shape, we'll do our branch. We'll come up here and we'll delete anything in the database with our name in it. Then we'll come down here, we'll do our mapping. We'll take everything from our EDI profile and we'll pass it into our database profile and then we'll write it to our database. So I come over here, what's going to happen When I come over here, what you will see is that there's actually four inserts. We have four pick ticket IDs. Everything is based off the pick ticket ID. So we're going to be entering it, the data into four rows. This is our insert statement. Now where it has a caret, that means that a null value is going in there. Uh, we do have a couple of values that we are passing in. You can see them. 
Here's my name, which is EDI Instructor. This is our default company ID, but you can see various pieces of information actually going into the field. And really what you need to do and to get this working is you need to get this to run all the way through successfully. And then you need to get a, a come into your document viewer, see that you have four records that are being loaded in and take a look at them. The only thing that will differ between mine and yours is the user ID. That's the only thing that differs between the two. I'm going to click on Close Document Viewer. Now it's your turn to do Class Activity number two to map the Level 1 Source and Destination fields. Class Activity number three to set the default values. Exercise number four to update the SQL command. And Exercise number five to test the process. When we return, we're going to be taking a look at EDI identifier instances. Now let's discuss EDI identifier instances. EDI identifier instances are placeholders in the EDI profile to identify specific data sets. At the loop and segment level, they categorize these data sets based on the numeric occurrence, such as the first loop or segment, and or a qualifier value within a given transaction. Now you can even pair these instances based on qualifiers and occurrences to isolate specific field elements. So let's begin learning about the qualifier value. Let's examine a snippet of data. Notice that there are multiple N1, N3, and N4 segments, each containing a different address. When we look at the spec, we learn the N1 segment code as the first position is known as the entity identifier code, and the value of BY indicates it is the buying party, and ST means it is the ship to address. So what would happen if I didn't have an identifier instance explaining to Atomsphere the type of address? Well, Atomsphere would attempt to create a separate record for each N1 address. And that's not what we want. We want to send these values to separate fields in our record. Mapping an EDI identifier instance is similar to mapping a placeholder. Del Boomi expanded this concept to work for XML profiles, but it originated here in EDI. The EDI profile has all of our segments. So if we expand the N1 segment, you will see an N1 loop. And within the N1 loop are various segments beginning with N10 and a number. By expanding the N101 element, notice it has no pre-identified qualifiers, no BY, no ST. So this is where we need to add qualifiers to identify the segment. Since we need two qualifier values, we can enter both the BY and the ST at the same time by clicking on the Add Qualifier button, entering our value, and clicking the Add Qualifier button again to enter the next one. You can add multiple qualifiers at one time by clicking on the Add Qualifier button. And not all possible qualifiers need to be entered, only the qualifiers that make the segment distinct. Right now, we only want the ship to and the build to, so any other codes would exist, we could choose to ignore them. Once we add the qualifier, we need to return to the EDI profile to add the instance. We begin by highlighting the main N1 loop segment in the header loop and clicking the blue drop-down arrow to add the identifier instance. We only want to reference the N1 loop at the loop level because we don't want our data to match the N1 segment, but we do want our data to correspond with the N2 and the N3 segments. Next, select the qualifier and click OK. Notice how it displays the EDI identifier instance of BY. Think of the qualifier instance as building in a condition in our map. For instance, I want to build a condition for the N1 loop where N101 equals BY. It moves away from the mold of allowing you to map uniquely. In the next section, we will perform the activity for the identifier instance.
let's look at our next activity. Within our 850 EDI, business information is presented in repeating sets containing the same segments and elements. Our warehouse tracking system requires this information be sent to the database fields. Therefore, our integration goals are as follows. We need to integrate unique codes for the department, vendor, and promotion sections which define the repeating REF segments. So how do we do this without leveraging a custom script? Well, the answer, of course, is the EDI identifier instance. Incorporate the unique date and time for our shipment and cancellation due dates. And finally, as I demonstrated with our N1 example, integrate a unique address for the ship to and the build to information. I'm going to demonstrate exercise number six to add the EDI identifier instances and exercise number seven to map the EDI identifier instances and test the process. This begins in your book on page 20 and it goes up to page 29. I am in my 850 EDI to database map. I'm going to click on the Walgut's 850 profile. I'm now looking at my profile. One of the things that we are going to be doing is adding identifier instances. One of the places we're going to be adding identifier instances is in our REF01. We'll be setting up qualifiers. But before we set up those qualifiers, let's open our spec. Right, let's take a look at our spec and see what the qualifiers are for REF01. The spec right now we're looking at the first page. You can scroll through. It has 16 pages, so all of this is data. We're going to go to the REF, which is the reference identification. And down here we have the REF01. This is segment 128. It has three qualifying codes. They are DP, which is the department number, IA, which is the, which is the internal, vendor number, and PD, which is the promotion or deal number. We're going to be using all three of those. So I'm going to minimize. And now I'm going to enter in those qualifiers. So my first qualifier is going to be IA. My second qualifier is going to be DP. So I have IA, DP, and my final qualifier is going to be PD. I'm going to click on the Save button. So the next place I want to go to, according to our instructions, is we want to create our identifier instance for the REF segment. The way that we do this is we come up to the actual segment, we click the drop down, and we select identifier instance. An identifier instance we can select by occurrence. This could be the first or the last one or the second or third we can also identify by qualifier. So I can just expand this and I can select the IA qualifier. And what this would do is this would give me, if I read it, it would be the last occurrence of the IA qualifier. So what I'm doing is I'm really, really narrowing this down. Now I don't want to do this, so I'm going to delete it. But what I will do now is I will set this up for what we want. And the way I delete it is I just come in and I say delete identifier instance. I could also edit it. If I edit it, all I would do is just come over here, take it off, and voila, I have my first one, which is REF01 equals IA. I go do my second one. We're going to do one for each. DP. And then finally, our last one which is going to be PD. Here we have our three identifier instances. Notice that it is a little bit different looking than a regular segment. The actual block here is uh, gray as opposed to green. And notice that we have our REF01 equal and then whatever our qualifier is going to be. So the next one we're going to go to is the DT segment. DT01 has qualifiers. So I'm going to bring this up and I'm going to do a I'm going to go down to the DT qualifier. I'm going to click on find. I'm just going to type in DTM. It takes me to the date time reference. 
if you notice, takes me to the date time reference. If you notice the date time reference, there is DTMO1. There is a qualifier. This is a date time qualifier. The first one is ship not before, which is 037, and 038 is ship no later. So we're going to come into our program under DT1, DTM1. We're going to add a qualifier. The first one is going to be 037, which will be our ship not before, and the second one will be 038 which is our ship no later. We're going to save this. And as we did with our REF segment, we're going to come up here. We're going to add the identifier instance. We're just going to do it by qualifier. We'll do identifier 37. And then we'll come back over here and do it again. And this time we'll do 3-8. So now we have qualifiers for each of them. Our final one is going to be the N1 loop. And this is a little bit more difficult because this is a group of segments that we're actually going to need to repeat together. You're going to see down here that there is an N101. This is the entity identifier code. It has two values. One is called BY, which is the buying party, which is the purchaser, and the other one is ST, which is the ship to party. So we are going to go into our N1 loop. And we're going to expand it all the way so we go to N101. And we're going to add our qualifiers. The first one is going to be BY for our buying party, and the second one is going to be ST for our ship to party. We'll add those. We'll save those. Now we will come up all the way up to our N1 loop because we want to loop everything. So we're going to come up here and we're going to add the identifier instance. We're going to identify by qualifier and the first one we'll do is BY for the buying party. And the second will be the ST for the ship to party. Now that we've created all this, we're going to move into our next activity. This is exercise number seven. We are going to map the EDI identifier instances, and then we're going to test them. So I'm going to save and close because I'm going to go back to my map. Come over here and map my fields. We're going to map the EDI identifier instance and then we're going to test the process. This is in your book on exercise number seven. We list the fields in exercise number seven. You have the option of using Boomi Suggest. If you use Boomi Suggest, you will come through and it will list what you're going to need. Um, I am going to do it a little bit different. I'm going to map it by hand. I want to be comfortable with what I have. I'm going to map REF01, where the reference identifier is equal to DP, and then this is my department. I'm going to map it to my department field. We're going to take the REF02 field. I want to close this up. I'm now going to do the IA, which is the REF02, and I'm going to map this to the vendor ID. I'm going to map the REF where the segment ID, REF01, where the segment ID equals PD, and I'm going to take the REF02 field, and that's going to go to the miscellaneous one field. I have all mapped all my REF segments. I'm now going to come down to my DT segments. I'm going to map DTM, DTM01, where it's equal to 37. I'm going to take the DTM02 field, and I'm going to map that to the due date. I'm also going to go down to 38, where it's equal to 38, and I'm going to take the DTM02 field, and I'm going to map that up to our cancel date. The next groups deal with the N1 segment. We're going to be looking at the BY first, and then we're going to come down and we're going to look at the ST. In BY, we're going to expand N101. We're going to be looking for N101, 
where the by equals n102. And we're going to be working in the build to. So I'm just going to bring this up. This is going to be equal to the build to name. And then I have 104 is going to go to the ID. I'm going to close that. I'm going to go down to N3. And N301 is going to be equal to the address one. And 302 is going to be equal to address two. We can close this up. Now I'll go down to the N4. And 401 is going to be equal to the city. And 402 is going to the state. And 403 is going to the zip. These are all build to. We can close that. Now we're going down to the ship to information. And 102 for ST is going to go to the ship to name. Just down here, I'm going to bring this up a little bit more so they're all listed. Uh, N104 is going to go to the ship to ID. We can close this. We can now go down to the 301 where we're going to send 301 equal to the address one and 302 equal to address two. Finally, for our last grouping, we're going to go down to the, the N4 section and we're going to send N401 equal to the city, N402 equal to the state, and 403 equal to the zip. Now what we will do is we will save everything. We're going to click on Save and Close. We're going to click on OK. We'll click Save one more time. And now we're going to run it. This completed successfully. I'm still inserting my four records. The main thing that you should be viewing is that there's a lot more data going into the database. There's more data than we had before. Uh, you're going to be seeing addresses, dates going into the database, types of information are heading into the database. And that's primarily what we're looking for. We're just looking to make sure that we're loading more data into the database that we have mapped. Now it's your turn to do exercise number six to add the EDI identifier instance and exercise number seven to map the EDI identifier instance and test the process. This begins in your book on page 20 and it goes up to page 29. Once you've completed this, you have completed the create portion of our class. We're going to be moving into the explore section where we're going to be examining trading partners and acknowledgments. As we enter the Explorer section of our class, we're going to shift our focus from data to learn how to implement a trading partner and process acknowledgements. In this section, we will learn about the trading partner creation and the ISA envelope. We'll learn how to create a functional acknowledgement, a 997. A functional acknowledgement is a receipt that is sent back to the trading partner with their respective format, letting them know that the document was received. We're also going to discuss the various communication methods used in EDI. Let's begin by discussing the EDI envelope, focusing on how they are parsed and created in Boomi. EDI envelopes identify header and summary from one or more business transactions. The data usually includes information about transaction types, date and time of processing, trading partner identification codes, and the total transaction numbers for summary reporting. A Boomi process can parse or create envelope data based on Boomi supported EDI standards, X12, Edifact, HL7. For all inbound EDI transactions, you can route and validate by trading partner. The Atomsphere process extracts the envelope information so the configuration and mapping focus on the core business data. 
For outbound EDI transactions, Atomsphere can auto-generate and attach your EDI envelopes to send finalized EDI files to your trading partners. Before we can begin our business scenario, we need to ask ourselves the following questions. Do you need to send acknowledgement transactions or any outbound EDI data with a Boomi auto-generated envelope back to your trading partner? Does the structure need to be validated and tracked via the official EDI standard as it enters or leaves the Boomi process? Well, if the answer is no, you can use a standard connector instead of a trading partner. Standard connectors such as AS2 Client, AS2 Shared Server, Disk, FTP, HTTP Client, and Web Services Server. However, if the answer is yes, then you need to explore the following use case to learn how to configure the required information for the EDI sender and receiver. Let's review the business use case for this section of training. As before, we are Dell Boomi consultants assigned with the task of completing a purchase order and 850 integration. Our company, Walgets, purchases products from Boomi. Now remember, in past activities, all of Walgett's purchase orders were completed via email. Today, we are using the same process, and we're going to expand it for Walgett's to systematically exchange documents with Boomi. Walgett's will send a purchase order transaction that is going to be stored in the inbound folder of the FTP server. The purchase order is then translated into a MySQL database. However, Walgetz has requested a functional acknowledgement, a 997B return, so Boomi will send the outbound file to the outbound folder on the file server for Walgetz to retrieve. This is the process we will update during the Explore section of our class. Notice the EDI is now being retrieved via FTP, and we have a trading partner. We have two branches, one for documents and the other for acknowledgements. Let's begin with the trading partner. The Component Explorer allows you to create a new trading partner component in the desired folder. The trading partner component can be configured for your company, which in this case is Boomi, or your trading partner, which is Walgetz. The start shape is where you define your trading partner standard. Click on Add My Company Standard to display the company standards. This is used to add the My Company Trading Partners for any of the X12, Edifact, HL7, Custom, or RosettaNet document standards needed in the process. When used in the start shape, this selects the document standards for the inbound process. For our class, we will be using one standard of X12. The communication method is used to select the communication protocol. The five available methods are AS2, DISC, FTP, HTTP, MLLP, or SFTP. We can only select one, so in our case we're going to use FTP to pull over the file seated on our FTP server. When the communication method is defined in the start shape, it is used to select the communication method for the inbound data, which allows only one inbound method per process. The trading partner start shape defines the My Company. For our class, My Company is Boomi, and we have created a trading partner named Boomi, which we'll examine in our slides. Our class will focus on Walgetz as the trading partner. The start shape is configured. Click on the hyperlink in our case, Boomi, to set up the trading partner. When configuring My Company, we will define it with the classification of This is My Company and give it a unique identifier. The identifier is arbitrary, but a best practice is to use the same name as the trading partner itself. Organization is an optional field which sets a predefined organization for the trading partner to use organized settings, such as multiple document standards for the same organization and share common information, such as con common contact information, for the organization. In this field, specify the organization component which has been previously set up, defined, or create a new organization component. For our class, we do not have a predefined organization, so we will leave the field blank. 
Let's take a look at the X12 Standards tab next. The tab has three drop-downs, one for ISA identifier options, ISA version control options, and GS version control options. The information to complete these sections is contained in the first two lines of your EDI file where the receiver information is stored. The next few slides will review it in detail. All of the information is contained in the envelope, which is the first two lines of the data file. For our class, it will be displayed below the screenshot. ISA01 is the first field, and it is described as the qualifier. ASA02 is the ID. In our case, the qualifier is 00, meaning that there's no authorization present. ISA03 and ISA04 contain the security information. Once again, we have nothing present. The interchange ID is what the sender and the receiver, you and Walgetz, agree to embed in your EDI envelope. A general rule of thumb is that the sender is always identified first and then the receiver. So we are receiving, so we will be using the second set of numbers. To set the ISA version and control standard, you need to provide the following information. ISA 11 is the interchange standard ID. This will always be U, as this is the US EDI standard. ISA 12 is the interchange version. This relates to the major version of the EDI standard. ISA 14 is the interchange acknowledge requested, the sender's code for requesting an acknowledgement. The ISA and the ISC segments are received and recognized. Zero means no acknowledgement request, one is for an acknowledgement request. ISA 15 is the test indicator, T for test, P for production, most will be production. ISA 16 is the component separator, which separates the data for the sub-element components. This commonly defaults to a colon or a greater than symbol. The GS information is contained in the second line of our envelope. Anytime you're using Atomsphere, and we would list the values like this, once again, our general rule of thumb is that the sender is identified first and then the receiver. So remember, you're Boomi, who's the receiver, and we're going to use the GS03 field, which usually is the same receiver field in your ISA interchange ID. GS07 is a responsible agency code. This is the controlling agency responsible for the type of document being sent. GS08 is the GS version. This is the code for the version. And as you become more comfortable reading your EDI files, you'll quickly be able to find the elements in the file. The Company Information tab is an optional tab where you will enter the address, contact, email, phone, and fax information for your trading partner. The Communications tab allows you to select the communications type being used. The fields you will need to enter will change for each communication type selected. You can identify multiple communication types in one trading partner and specify the one that you want to apply in the different integration scenarios. Remember, EDI, de EDI deployment licensing applies at the trading partner and not at the connection level. The archiving options are similar to the connection operation archiving options defined here. Because the partner components can handle both inbound and outbound documents, there's a separate directory setting for each. The Trading Partner Where Use tab shows processes that reference the selected trading partners. You can open the process to edit or view by clicking on the process name. You can also view the process deployment containing the trading partner by clicking on the link in the deployments column to open it in the Deploy Processes page. If the link reads View Deployment, then the latest version of the process is deployed. If the text link reads No Deployment, the process is not deployed. So how are trading partners different from standard connectors? Each trading partner component supports multiple 
communication methods. Notice that we have AS2, DISC, FTP, and SFTP. However, at the start shape, you can only define one communication method per process execution. Looking at more ways that the trading partner differs from the standard connector, each method supports the configuration of both the connection and the operation settings. The data processing options allow you to do broad-based changes to the document before the transactions are processed. Some examples include PGP handling or encryption and zipping and unzipping of files. The FTP method has both a get and send option, each containing a separate data processing options tab. So far we've examined my company, which is Boomi. Soon we're going to need to set up a trading partner for Walgetz. So let's examine the sample trading partner and see if we can spot the differences between Boomi, which is my company, and the ABC Corporation, which is my trading partner. Within the X12 standard tab, the basic options exist only for the trading partner. This allows you to indicate if you want an acknowledge to be returned to the trading partner. Within the basic X12 options tab, the functional acknowledgement options specify the functional acknowledgement is generated. These are only used for inbound 997s. Do not acknowledge, which is the default. If this is selected, it will not return a functional acknowledge. Acknowledge functional groups will acknowledge at the GS level. Acknowledge transaction sets. When you choose this option to send your acknowledgement, you will, know you will not need to send a map. Boomi will automatically generate it for you. The functional acknowledgement options are defined at this level and are only required when constructing your trading partner. The document envelope option specifies how the document sets are grouped, grouped in outbound interchanges. A particular company may want the data to be grouped a specific way. The default is grouped by interchange. A single interchange can have one or more functional groups. We can group by functional group which means that all the transaction sets with the same message type are grouped together, resulting in a single functional group per interchange. We also can group by transaction set. There is a single interchange for each transaction set. The element delimiter tells Boomi the, how to delimit the fields in the file. Star delimited, which is the default, is the one we will be using. The segment termination character sets the termination character for the message segments. No line or no end character is the default. Our file uses tilde. And finally, the last one is to filter functional acknowledgements. You will check this if you are processing data on a trading partner and you want to process receipts. This concludes our discussion on trading partner creation. Our next section will go over the activities associated with this, where we will download the explore process and create a trading partner. I'm now going to do exercise number eight to download the explore process and exercise number nine to create the Walgetz trading partner. This is in your book on page 30 to 34. We're now going to create a new folder for our explore process. In our EDI1 folder, we're going to create a new folder by clicking on the blue dropdown, New Folder. We're going to call this folder EDI Inbound. We're going to just in parentheses put the word explore. We're going to call this EDI Inbound, and in parentheses we're going to place the word explore. Click on Save. Our new folder is created. We're going to populate it by going to the Process Library. We're going to, we're going to sort by process name. We're down the bottom so you can scroll all the way down because we're Walgetz. We're looking for Walgetz 850 inbound in parentheses explore. We will install that. We have to choose our location, it's our brand new directory that we created, the Explore directory. 
we'll click on Install. The process has been installed. We're going to close it. Just make sure it is out there. We're going to create a new trading partner for Walgets. So the way that we do this is we come back over to our folder for our EDI Inbound Explorer. We're going to create new component. The type of component it's going to be is a trading partner. So we go all the way down here to the bottom. We're going to call our trading partner Walgets. Make sure it's going in the correct, we want to make sure it's going in the correct folder, which it is in the Explorer folder. We have our standards. We have X12, Edifact, HL7, Custom, and RosettaNet. We're going to select X12. And we want to make sure that the radio button says, this is the, this is the partner I trade with. We're going to select Create. Creates the default Walgets trading partner. We're going to need to customize it. The first thing that we have here is our overview. We want to verify that the standard is correct, which it is. It's Walgets. The identifier, what we typically do is, this is really an arbitrary field, but what we typically do is we populate it with the name of the trading partner. So I'm going to type in Walgets. Notice it is in capital letters. I'm going to click on the X12 standard. I have some basic X12 options because this is a trading partner. The first one that I want to do is set up a functional acknowledgement. So I'm going to acknowledge on transaction sets. The default is do not acknowledge. I want to acknowledge on transaction sets. I am going to group by interchange. My element delimiter is going to be a star, which is the default. My segment terminator is going to be a tilde. And do I want to filter for functional acknowledgements? Yes, I do. And if I don't check on this, I'm not going to get a functional acknowledgement. I'm going to click on the Save button. Now it's your turn to do exercise number eight to download the Explorer process, and exercise number nine to create the Walgett's trading partner. This is in your book on pages 30 to 34. When we return, we will be discussing document types within our trading partners. We will continue discussing the differences between my company and the trading partners, this time focusing on the document type tab. So let's continue examining the differences between Boomi, which is my company, and the ABC Corporation, which is our trading partner. Notice the trading partner has an extra tab for document types. This provides the ability for trading partners to enable acknowledgement, handling, and document tracking. Within the document types tab, if I want to have an acknowledgement, I need to register my document type. In the document types, I will need to select the transmission. In this case, I am selecting an 850 and then I will press the OK button. The Document Options tab will then display. There are three different types of acknowledgements. 997 is the most common. If you want a 997, you will only need to register your document type. If you want a 999 or a TA1, you will need to check one of the checkboxes. 999 acknowledgements are similar to 997 acknowledgements, but they are used for acknowledging healthcare related transaction sets. This includes X12 version 5010 and higher. The TA1 interchange, ISA and IEA acknowledgement, TA1 acknowledgements have a transaction set document property set to TA1. If you want to route the TA1 interchange documents to processes, you'll turn off the Filter Functional Acknowledgement checkbox on the Trading Partners tab, the Basic X12 options, and use the Trading Partner Set document property to route the TA documents. So we are doing a 997, so in order to do this, we're just going to press Close. I'm going to demonstrate exercise number 10 in your book. To configure a document type, this is in your book on page 35 to 36. 
I'm going to click on the document type tab. I'm going to add a document type. It will select all the transmissions available. I'm going to enter in 850. I entered 850 and it automatically brought up a purchase order. I will highlight it and then I will click on the OK button. I'm not going to need to do anything on here because I which is a 997. So I'm going to click on the close button. We'll automatically add the document type and now I will save it. Now it's your turn to do exercise 10 to configure the document types. When we return, we will be discussing the ISA and GS options. We're now going to be examining the trading partner ISA and GS options. Returning to the ISA identifier options, now as an inbound document, we will use the first value for each. So in this case, we are passed an identifier value of 8, which is the UCC communication code. Notice this is the only ISA identifier option containing a value. I'm now going to demonstrate exercise number 11 to configure the ISA and the GS options. This is in your book on page 37 to 39. All of the information for your X12 standard tab is contained in the first two lines of your EDI envelope. This is your ISA envelope and your GS envelope line. So we're going to go through and populate these fields and also we're going to take a look at where they are in our file. So the first one that we're using is ISA01 and ISA02. So this is ISA01, I'm highlighting it, and this is ISA02. ISA01 is 00 for us. In other words, we're not going to have any authorization information present. But we do have to take the value, which is an ISA02. We can copy this and paste it, or you can type it in. It is 10 zeros. And we're just going to place it in the ID line. Make sure there are no spaces before or after these values, because if there are, you will get an error message. The second one is the security information. Once again, we have no security information present, so therefore we're going to be using 10 zeros as the ID, and we can paste that information in. Scrolling down, we have our interchange ID. This is ISA 05-7 and ISA 06-8. Now, remember, we are receivers. We're going to be using the ISA 05 and ISA 06. So if I look over here, ISA 05 is 08. If I come down here on my drop-down, 08 is the UCC communications number. So I'm going to select that. The next one is the number that's going to go into that. I'm going to select over here the UCC communication number and paste it. And that will be it for the ISA identification options. We'll come close this and we will go to the ISA version control. We're still going to be working on the ISA envelope, but we're going to query all the way over. The first thing we need to find for the ISA envelope is ISA 11 which is going to be our interchange standard ID. We're going to be using a U, which is right here, so we'll place a U in there. The next one, uh, which is right next to it, is the ISA interchange version, and this is going to be 00401, so we're just going to copy and paste that in. This is, do we want an interchange acknowledge requested? We're not, we have a zero in that field, so we're gonna not click on this. The next one is the test indicator, and your options are T or P, and in your file, it will be T or P. P is the default, and ours is a P. Finally, the last one is ISA 16. ISA 16 is the component separator. Our component separator is going to be a greater than symbol. So we are now done with the ISA version control options. 
We're now going to go down into the second line, which is the GS envelope, the GS envelope line, and this is going to be the GS version and control options. We have our GS application code, and we're going to be using GS02. This, by the way, is the exact same thing as our ISA, so as, I, as you notice, once I highlighted it, they came up on both lines. For the responsible agency code, which is GS7, ours is going to be an X. It can be T or X. T is the Transportation Data Coordinating Committee. X is the accredited standards. We will be using accredited standards. And then the last one that we have is our GS version. Our GS version is going to be the field is going to be GS08. So we highlight this and it's going to be 004010. And now just make sure that you save it. Now it's your turn to complete exercise number 11 to configure the ISA and GS options in your book. This is in your book on page 37 to 39. When we return, we will be discussing EDI architecture and communication methods. Now we're going to move in and discuss EDI architecture and communication methods. Let's re-examine the My Company and Trading Partner at this time, focusing on what they have in common. Both have a communication tab when designing the trading partner process. One communication setting will take precedence, depending on the type of architecture you deploy. It is important to understand what EDI architecture type you need. To do this, you need to ask yourself the following questions. Does your company use a van, mailbox, or a centralized storage for all EDI transactions? For anyone who does not know what a van is, it is a value-added network, which is a hosted service offering which acts as an intermediary between business partners sharing standards-based or proprietary data via business processes. So does your company use a van? Would you like to use a single process to schedule data retrieval for multiple partners? Do you need Boomi to auto-generate acknowledgments to send back to your trading partners? Well, if the answer is yes, then you should consider a centralized architecture. For centralized processing, you can define multiple trading partners within a single start shape or trading partner shape as long as each partner supports the same communication method. And in the My Company component, you can define the default communication details for receiving and sending any trading partner. This process will sort the transactions based on the envelope details. In the trading partner components, you should check Use All Defaults to defer the connectivity details paired with the My Company component. If you need to route documents to different maps or child processes, you can use document property parameters to confirm the, send, the sender information. However, in our scenario, we are going to be building out a decentralized process to support the retrieval of our Walgoods 850 data. Since the default checkboxes are not checked, the communications will take precedence in the trading partner and the My Company communication information is ignored. So I'm going to demonstrate exercise number 12 to define a communication method and enable the process define the communication method and enable the process. We're going to click on Add Communication Method. We're going to select FTP and click on the OK button. It will ask us if we want to use all default settings. We do not. We're going to configure specific settings. Under the Settings section, we're going to use the default settings. We want that to be checked on. However, the Get and the Send options, we want to uncheck those. Now, one thing you need to be aware is we are working with FTP, so everything is going to be spelling and case sensitive. For our remote directory, to get our records for the remote directory, it's going to be called Inbound. 
and our file filter is going to be called 850-EDI-4-BUMI.EDI. This, this is going to be a type binary, uh, maximum files to read. We're going to take everything out there. It's the only thing in the directory. For our output, we're going to be writing to a directory known as out. And we're going to click on close. At this point, we're going to click on Save and Close. We want to go back into our start shape. So we're going to select our trading partner. Our trading partner is Walgetz. Once we select it, it will populate that list and we'll click on the OK button. So what we want to do now is drop and drag a trading partner over. So we can just come up here and type in TR and it'll bring a trading partner up for us. We'll just drop and drag it over. Our communication method is going to be FTP. Our standards are going to be X12. My company is, of course, Boomi. We click on OK. And next, what we want to do is click on Walgetz as the trading partner. At this point in time, we click on OK. We're going to hook this up, and then we're going to click on Save and Close. Now it's your turn to do exercise number 12 to define the communication method and enable the process. This is in your book on page 40 to 44. When we get back, we're going to interpret the trading partner data. Now we're going to run our process and take a look at our trading partner data. Once our process successfully runs in the build tab, let's spend a few moments interpreting the data. Notice that we have six files for our output. The first file is a placeholder, signifying the raw document is retrieved. If you deploy and execute the process in production, then this raw document is viewable in the process reporting tab. The second file is the acknowledgement. If you don't have an acknowledgement, this becomes the first transaction. Next are each of the individual transactions. Even though our single document had multiple transactions, Atomsphere automatically splits them. We didn't have to create a process shape. The connection data status is not displayed in the build tab, but it is displayed in the production mode. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk through exercise number 13. I'm going to test the trading partner process and interpret the data. This begins in your book on page 45 and it goes to page 46. On our build tab, we're going to click on the test button in the upper right hand corner. We're going to select our atom, which is the test atom cloud, and give it a run. Our process is complete at running. I'm just going to bring this up so we can examine our data. Our first file has nothing in it, and it didn't leave the trading partner shape. Basically, this acts as a placeholder for the raw EDI data file. Now, when we have a deployed process, and we look at it in the process reporting view, this will have the raw data document. Um, it'll show the full file before we split it into each individual transaction. Since we have an acknowledgement, we go down the acknowledgement path, we produce an acknowledgement file. If we did not have an acknowledgement, this would contain the first record. We go down to number three, and it works all the way from three to six. We'll be coming down the branches and we're inserting into the database as we did before. So nothing different going on here except that it's each individual record. Now it's your turn to do exercise number 13 to test the trading partner process and interpret the data. This begins in your book on page 45 and 46. When we return, we will be going into the manage section of our class and we will be implementing document tracking and taking a look at document tracking in the process reporting page. The last section in class is the manage section. Here we look at how to enable and interpret document tracking in EDI.
This section consists of exercises only, so I'm going to demonstrate exercise number 14 to download the manage process, exercise number 15 to enable the EDI document tracking, and wrap it all up with exercise number 16 to manage the EDI documents. This begins in your book on page 47 and it goes all the way up to page 65. In the Component Explorer, next to EDI1, I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to call this folder EDI Inbound, and then in parentheses put Manage. This is where I'm going to keep all of my Manage process. I'm going to go to the Process Library. I'm going to search on Process Name. We're going to go all the way to the end because ours is Walgets, and I'm going to download well, it's 850 inbound manage, so I'll install that. I need to select the directory, the locate the installation directory. It's going to be my EDI inbound manage. Click on install. That ends exercise number 14. I'm now going to go into exercise 15 where we're going to enable document tracking. Document tracking is in the setup menu. It's all the way down here at the bottom and development resources. This is where I'm going to set up my track field labels. I have two field labels I'm going to set up. My first one is going to be order number and my second is going to be due date. We're going to set this up as a date time. I'm going to return back onto my build tab. I'm going to go into my EDI manage and I'm going to open up my trading partner. And this is going to be for Walgets. Earlier in this class, we were in here, we set up an acknowledgement. First thing we're going to do is select our profile. Our profile is coming under EDI, it's inbound, and it's called Walgets 850 profile. We're next going to select our track fields. We have two track fields. One is the order number, and the other one is the due date. The order number, let's do that first. We're going to come up here, select the field value. This is going to be a profile element. It's going to be EDI. We're going to select the profile. It's going to come from the Walgets 850 profile. We're going to get this field from BEG03. So we're going to come down here, expand the BEG segment, and grab, and that's going to be my order number. The second is my due date. Once again, it's going to be a profile element. It's going to be EDI, this one, from the Manage tab. The due date is going to be DTM, where DTM equals 37, and we're going to be selecting DTM02. We're going to close this. We're going to save and close. We are now on our final activity, exercise number 16, where we're going to deploy and manage our trading partner documents. I'm going to come over to the deploy tab and we're going to come into our manage. We want to save and deploy. So I'm just going to put a note here that I added track field. I'm then going to go over into my manage tab and go to process reporting. I'm going to execute this guy once. So the way that I execute it is I'll come over to Execute Process. I'll select my Atom, which is the Atom Cloud. And then I'll go out there and I'll execute my Walgets 850 Inbound Manage. And I'll click on the Execute tab. I'm going to turn the auto refresh on so that way we can see all right, we're going to execute this Walgets 850 Inbound Manage so we can take a look at everything. All right, we have success. So now let's take a look at the process. You'll notice that when we come in here, we have six records. Everything was successed. We had four rows being inserted into the database. We have two for X12. So why don't we take a look first at the start. 
This is broken into our inbound file. It's 850 EDI for Boomi. If I click on the X12, divided into two sections now, one of them is raw data and the other one is X12. So if I look at the X12, I have two areas there. I have documents and functional acknowledgments. The documents are each of our individual rows. And notice now the order number is being displayed as well as the order date. As far as acknowledgement goes, this is our functional acknowledgement. If I look at the data, you'll see that the functional acknowledgement was brought over. Let's grab an order number. Let's just say we grab this order number down here, 0065-9812075-5787. We copy it. We can come over here where it says executions and go into trading partner. Within executions, I do see my order number and my due date for each individual row, except for the first one, which is my functional acknowledgement. If I click on Add Filter, I can filter by atoms, tracked fields, trading partners, to and from trading partners, and the standard document. I'm going to do track fields. I'm going to do order number. But I'm going to place the order number up here. Now one thing I do want to point out to you, this is um, an undocumented feature. When you copy and paste, notice it places a tab up here. You just need to backspace it and move it all the way over. We'll click on Apply, and now it's narrowed it down to that one particular order number. We're going to click on the X, and we've searched through. So now it is your turn to do exercise number 14 to download the manage process, exercise number 15 to enable the EDI document tracking, and exercise number 16 to manage your EDI documents. This is in your book on page 47 and it goes to page 65. Once you have completed this, you have completed our EDI training. Uh, this is our EDI level one training. We hope that you've enjoyed the class and we look forward to seeing you in future EDI training events. Thank you.